we're going to start with the living. So what we, we talked about Reb Zusha. Reb Zusha and Reb Elimelech were brothers. Reb Zusha was known for his humility and Reb Elimelech was known for in the secular world what they call tzaddikism which is translated as the emphasizing the role of the tzaddik. So I'm going to start off. Yes. This is about 200 years ago, a little over 200 years ago. And his most significant writing is called the Nomali Malach. And in the back, and it's based on the Parsha. So it goes through the Parshiot of the Torah reading. And if you look in the back, there's a section called the Kute Shoshana, which just means kind of things that were alika. The alika just means compilation. So here's the first teaching that he, he says in uh, this Likut, in this compilation. On a verse that says that it should be good for you in this world and the next world, uh, a rabbinic, a rabbinic verse. So he says, look, on the one hand, the goal of this world is so that you have Olam Haba. But what, do, what is it that we need to get into Olam Haba? We need Torah and Mitzvahs. Well, what do we need to have to be able to do Torah Mitzvahs? You need wealth. You need to have a home so you could invite guests. You need to have money so you could give tzedakah. You need to have a backyard, which is almost impossible in Manhattan, so you can have a sukkah. And you need to have good credit, so they'll give you a little bit of an asterisk. <laughs> and a mezuzah. And uh, you know, you you want to get married? It's it's not cheap. Ask David Barrett. He's uh, he's a divorce attorney. He can tell you. He can tell you what you're up against, what you'd be in for, right? So these things are these things all cost money. And, and even a tzaddik, maybe especially a tzaddik, needs those things in abundance. So that's what it means. Ashrecha, praise are you and, and good in this world and, and in the next world. If you have, that even though that the wealth you have in this world isn't the purpose, it's in order that you get to the next world. So I think this is a, what do they call it? The, the prosperity gospel or mm -hmm. the theology? What's the word they're banding about with like the, the Olson, uh, the, these kind of- um, Yeah, yeah, prosperity, yeah. yeah, prosperity gospel. Right. Prosperity gospel. So, yeah, so, so this is, I, I'm not really familiar with the prosperity gospel. I'm not gonna lie to you, but it sounds like they're telling people that it's okay to be wealthy. It's not like uh, what a lot of Catholics think it isn't okay to be wealthy. What, it's more than that. They're saying um, wealth is a sign of God's grace and poverty is a sign of God's displeasure. Uh, but that's like um, the Protestant stuff already. So that's yeah. not nothing new there. Okay, they yeah. make it like these guys are, they invented it or something. They, it's been around for a while. It's an old story. So apparently even the... Um, even even the Dalai had some version of it. And it was even more that it was like a tzaddik needs to have all that. Not just that uh, everyone should have it, but a tzaddik also needs. A tzaddik is, especially needs to have the ability to do those things. But but even if you're, excuse me, even if you're poor, I mean, you can tithe, if you make $10,000 a year, so you tithe 10% or you know, you whatever level you're at, you can do the mitzvot. I don't think you have to have an excessive amount of money in order to be at a high level. Of it. Um, yeah, you know, here's an interesting question. Here's a question that a lot of people are talking about in the non-Orthodox world, where let's say you, you want to live in a non-Orthodox community, 
If you have children, you want to send them to Mount Orthodox uh, Day School. Um, and then you have to kind of, you know, do the math. It's super expensive. So yeah. there's a lot of discussions about that, that we're like pricing ourselves out of existence almost, that there's, that there's, um, but I don't want to get too off track because whenever you talk about what's going on in the world today, we, we somehow, we somehow get off track from what he's talking about, but what was he talking about? What was he talking about? So let's compare him to his own brother, Abzusha. Abzusha was extremely poor. Abzusha often looked like a beggar, even after he was already a, a Hasidic Rebbe of some acclaim. So I'm sure they both came from a similar background. And, and Rebbe Limelech didn't have a problem with embracing a new reality. He's a Rebbe, he has supporters. Not only will he accept their support so that he has the bare minimum, he doesn't mind having a nice home. And he wasn't even, by the way, that's not what he was known for. He wasn't known to be an opulent. Uh, the one who was known to be an opulent Rebbe was the Rizhner Rebbe. The Rizhner looked lived like a prince, lived like a king. He had a palace. He had uh, many horses. He, he lived like royalty. But the normally Melech was already exploring this thing that you don't, there's no mitzvah to be poor, is, is more how I would put it. That's one thing. Okay, prosperity. The second thing is that, you know, the, the modern person reads that and says, oh, this Rebbe likes to live it up, right? That's because we're critical. But what if we didn't take it for granted and said the goal of the gashmiut of the material possessions is really for the sake of heaven if you could believe that if you could get if you could say that now let's okay so that's one thought that it's prosperity and the second thought is that prosperity for the sake of heaven if you can buy that that's the second thought now, the, the most famous thing of, of the normally mouth that I mentioned before is basically you really need the tzaddik. We'll, we'll get to some specific Torahs about how you really need the tzaddik. But let's, let's talk a little bit about humility. Because one of the, one of the key tenets of Hasidism especially as opposed to the way they painted the misnagdom. I say the way they painted the misnagdom is because they painted the misnagdom as not being refined in terms of dealing with their ego. Because if you study the Talmud, and let's say you assume that the average Lithuanian style rabbi sees themselves in line with the tradition of the Tanayim, the Amarayim, the Gaonim, the Rishonim, and the Achronim. What do we find is the, the number one commodity in the Talmud, in the stories of the Talmud? The psychology of what was scarce and they all wanted more of. Not, not a physical substance, not money, not, not homes. Kavod. Kavod. The, there, was, there was not enough honor to go around. Everybody felt slighted constantly, belittled. Not, not much different than today. It was a very common thing. Oh, yeah. Rabbi so Yosef, you, what do you say? What? No different. It's not different. Okay. No, so, we're the so same. different. You know, so different. We're in an enlightenment. We're in the same. Bro. We're all we're nice to each other all the time. I see it in the news in Israel all the time. There's nothing but just Ahavat Israel. Like, it's just so clear. You're saying that facetiously. What do you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. facetiously. So, so, and these were rabbis who, ex who, who, who uh, they preach Ahavat Israel, yet they, you know, it didn't always translate. Now, 
there, there's there's different ways to see it. One way to see it is you, if you were a rabbi and you and you were considered, at least in your own eyes, a senior rabbi, and a younger upstart rabbi would challenge your authority. That could be seen as a challenge to the whole tradition. Since the older you were, the more of a receipt time you had to receive a tradition. They, remember, they didn't have anything in writing back then. So everything was recorded by teacher to disciple. So there's there's a lot of different ways. So in other words, it's not it, it, if somebody disrespects me, me personally, disrespect me all you want, but I'm the rabbi of a shul, so you're disrespecting the community. So really, because I'm an easygoing guy and I let people get away with disrespecting me, I have no right to do that because they're disrespecting my community. So that's the mentality that would excuse why everybody was always getting insulted. They weren't getting personally insulted, but, but you and I know that, you know, they were getting personally insulted. So, so the Hasidim claimed that the Mishnagim, you know what they inherited from the Talmud? Ego. In, you know, kavod, honor. And what about the Hasidim? Did they not uh, have any ego? Of course they did. The difference is that the Hasidim would constantly belittle themselves. And so, for example, I'm trying to remember which Rebbe it was. It was one of the ones that we're talking about, like a it's like a Radichev, where his contemporary, the non-Hasidic Rebbe of the town was really bothered by how popular he was getting. And he and and he would talk to Rebbe Levi Yitzhak. So he told Rebbe Levi Yitzhak, what's going on? All these people are coming. He says, I don't know why they're coming. He said, they must be coming because they think you're a great tzaddik. Why don't you set them straight and tell them the truth? Tell them that you're not a great tzaddik. So he says, a good point, I'll do that. So the next Shabbos comes, and Rebbe Levi Yitzhak says, I, I, I have to confess, I, I hear people are saying things about me that are just not true. They, 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 I'm not a tzaddik. I'm really not a tzaddik. And, you know, if you're coming to me because you want to come to a tzaddik, you're going to the wrong place. The next week, three times as many people showed up. And who got really, <laughs> who got, who really went crazy from this? His, the, his contemporary, the, the Litvish, the Mestagish rabbi in the town. And he, he says, what, what happened? He says, I don't know. I guess they, he said, they must think that you're such a great tzaddik. You're, you're even more than a tzaddik. You're humble. And they must be responding to your humility. They like your humility. But why don't you do this? Why don't you go and say, you know what? I, I, the truth is I am a tzaddik. Because the Misnagid figured if he told them that, that they wouldn't like that and they wouldn't keep coming. So Rebbe Yitzhak responded, look, you told me to say I'm not a tzaddik. That I was able to say. But to go and claim I'm a tzaddik, I'm not a liar. I'm not going to claim that about myself. So one of the kind of endearing features of the early Hasidic masters, again, it, it didn't last necessarily that long, was that they had a certain humility. So, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you that now. Now here's the problem with that is that on the one hand they had this humility, on the other hand, they had a certain audaciousness of, you know, telling people that they, they needed to come to, to be enlightened and to be, their souls to be cleansed to a tzaddik. So that, and the reason why it's important for me to tell you this is because this is what's going to plague, it's going to invigorate, or not even, the word invigorate is something that exists but needs invigoration. It's invigorate Judaism and create a mass movement in, in Poland called Polish Hasidism, which is this kind of give and take between this humility and this grandiosity of spirit that the Rebbe, that, that you could go to the Rebbe's court and just get lost in the intensity of the experience. So here's one of the teachings, the second teaching in Lukut Shoshana of, of Rebbe Lemelech of the Shansk, the Dom Lemelech, 
that is about the humility. So he quotes the verse, which which we say is from Tehillim, that we say in the Halal, Pischuli Shari Tzedek, open up for me the gates of righteousness so I may enter. So what is the main avoda, the main spiritual work of a tzaddik? Is that the higher the tzaddik goes, the more they realize that they can never reach their their true tachlit, their true purpose. They can't fulfill, they can't become enlightened, they can't become fulfilled, they can't reach their truest goal. They're always going to be on a journey to quote the Baal Shem Tov, which he doesn't hear, but I'll quote him. Yismach leiv mivakshi Hashem, the psalmist says, the searcher, the, what, the God searcher rejoices. It does not say, the Baal Shem Tov says, the one who found God is rejoicing. It says the one who is looking for God. People who have found God are unhappy. It's the journey, it's the search that gives them joy. So similarly, Rabbi Melchus says the sense of saying the higher you go, the more you realize you're never really going to get there. You're never going to be able to say, I found God. I I re I obtained the level that I was put on this earth to obtain. I'm, that's yeah. such, I'm having such a hard time with all of this because there's a lot of gall involved to think that you're going to end up being a perfection of who you're supposed to be. I mean, life is a journey. It's a learning process. And the more you learn, the higher level you are. I mean, it's, it almost feels like they want to be godlike in their own way. I mean, reach a level where uh, why is it so important as long you, as they're you like a premise? You don't like the premise that easy that, that somebody would think they could reach. Uh, reach you know, what could reach perfection? perfection or... I mean, life the perfection should not even be a goal. The, being the best you can do and always rising and learning and going to higher levels, but because you didn't reach the highest level possible, I mean that that seems obsessive and compulsive. Well, I think you're dealing with people that really felt they were. See, to understand that, that's why I gave the introduction that there, that, that there were people who literally felt that they had obtained perfection. So he was responding to what, what he considered the wrong way, which he felt other people would believe that they had, they had arrived spiritually. They were... They were gotten to the level of what, what we would call uh, perfection. There was, a, there was a Rebbe who said that I'd rather be with a sinner who knows he's a sinner than a saint who knows he's a saint. And they said, what about, uh, what about a sinner who thinks he's a saint? He goes, oh, that person there's truly no hope for, you know. Um, but but the, 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 that's that's now you might be saying is it, it's obvious that you have to have this humility to not think you've arrived, but it wasn't obvious to his contemporaries. It's not even humility; it's a sensibility. It's like w what is life about, other than you know trying to grow? But it it, it becomes compulsiveness and upset. Yeah, learning and achieving a level becomes like almost a competition with yourself of how high you can go instead of just doing your best. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a second, there's two parts of this. The, the second part is a little bit to, to always see yourself as a beginner, which to me is like when I see the baby, you know, when I see the baby, the baby's a beginner. And that's a wonderful thing because a baby is like just just absorbing everything. Um, that's another that leads me to another related thing that I don't think it was unique to the the, the medical Lashansk, but but to that group of Hasidim, the students of the Magad. I think they all got it from the Magad, and each one of them might have had it a little bit differently, but it's the same overall theme which is 
somebody who knows something is often the hardest person to do inner work on themselves. Let me explain that to you. What, one of the, how do I explain this? I've had teenage children, right? I still have one. The, the hardest thing to do is to help a young person who thinks they know everything. Am I being pretty clear? The, you know, when they're a little kid and they need help, at least they know they need help. When they're a young adult and they really don't want to hear a word you have to say, you can't, it, it's very hard it, when you know you can help them and they, they just won't hear one word you have to say, look, I was there. I was that teenager. I rebelled also. A lot of us did that. I think the Rebbies felt that there were a lot of teenage Jews who just thought they knew it all. I don't mean there were teenagers that there were 18. Yes, did you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I think it's still very much the case today. You know? Uh, meaning what? And it bothers a lot of spiritual leaders is that there's a group of the most learned Jews. I don't say the most, most. They're not the highest level, but they're relatively like the, the, the group of Jews that have a yeshiva background, have have some Talmudic knowledge, have maybe read quite a bit of the Shulchan Aruch, no, no uh, Chumash and Rashi. And those are the hardest people to awaken spiritually. Because they think, because they're teenagers, they don't, they're teenagers, the young adults that really refuse to learn. Am, am I making myself clear? Will refuse to advance beyond whatever they have in yeah, the they background. Think they, they think they 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 think they're the God's gift to mankind. They just really do. And by the way, that's still an issue till today. This this thing that I'm talking about. It, it's 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 a, it's like a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You know, you have these people. They know a little something, and they don't listen to anyone. They think they they don't they don't grow because they don't they're not capable of growing because they don't believe they can grow. They really think they're God's gift to mankind. So that I think is a common theme, not just in the Noble Mela, but the Kedusha Slavi and, and a lot of these works, okay? Well, they may be growing in other areas too, besides- Well, they're growing in the sense Jewish that studies, they may, I mean- They may be, they may be. I, I think they're growing on their pace, but it's very, again, ego-driven. No one else is gonna help them. It's like somebody who refuses to be helped by anyone else. Even if they're, let's say I know that I have somebody in my neighborhood who's phenomenal at something and he's open to having a you know, conversation about it. And I was like, there's nothing that guy can teach me. Certain arrogance in that. I mean, you were an unhoused. So I was saying, where was I last night? I was at a shear, not giving a shear. I was attending a shear. Because I don't think I know everything there is to know. I know I'm still a student. You can teach and study at the same time. But there are some people literally who will not go to a class. They really think they've surpassed everyone or there's no one greater than them. And it's not just, and more than just in study, it's in avodas Hashem. It's, it's in sometimes we need a little help in, in our spiritual growth. And we need a guide and people, and I think that was a common theme of the students of the mind. Okay. So does the, that contextualize it better, I hope. And also I remember um, one of my teachers, Rabbi Ezra Shochad in Los Angeles, he was saying, we don't understand that even the misnagdim of today are not the real misnagdim of the time of the students of the Magad of Mitzrich. He was saying then they were really had real ego issues. Like the ones today are not as egotistical. Wow. <laughs> you could they're imagine. Pretty, 
they're pretty egotistical now. I, I, I would hate to But you can imagine there wasn't a temperament. By the way, there's also been a whole Musser movement. It's not just Hasidism that is dealing with this. It's Musser. Musser is a movement dealing very much with the same issue. You see, you see I think part of Chabad's success is that Many of the um, um, sluchim uh, are uh, they, they are social workers besides teachers, and I think sometimes people it's, it's not like people today they've lost their passion for Judaic learning. It doesn't mean that they think they're above it or they know everything. They they've just into other stuff. So sometimes you have to connect to people where they yeah, are. That's true. That's true. That's, yeah, that's, true. that's why Chabad filled an important uh, niche. Yeah, they're very successful because that. they understand it's not about that, you know, they're just not there. They're not, yeah. They've lost yeah. their connection. Yeah. But there are plenty of Jews who feel a learning connection, but don't like to ever see somebody above them in their mind that could give them something. Like, kind of like a like a teenage child who doesn't want to recognize that the parent may know something that they don't know, you know, very similar. So let's do another Torah. So we're going to be learning Parshish Yisro. which is the Torah reading of the Torah being given. So it says, God spoke all of these things saying, and then he started the 10 commandments after that. So the Zohar says, the Holy Zohar says, what is the word S call? All, all of these. So it says that's, that's Abraham. So what does that mean? So we know Abraham fulfilled the whole Torah even before it was given. Question is, how did he know what the Torah is? And the answer is, he knew it internally because he was a very mystical person. He managed to connect to the source. And through that connection, through that intense connection, he could see the mystical worlds and understand what, you know, what, 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 the, the, what is tzitzis? He could understand it, not necessarily just in its physical form, the way many of us just simply do the mitzvah, but he understood it in its primal, mystical elements, which in their manifestation is the actual tzitzis. The same thing with tefillin, the same thing with Shabbos, the same thing with sukkahs, the same thing with Pesach, and so on and so forth. Now, we just can learn Torah. By the way, a lot of people don't realize that the more Torah you learn, the more you understand the fullness of the experience of any mitzvah. A lot of a lot of um, a lot of people only learn a little Torah, so they don't really have the full depth of the mitzvah. But the more Torah you learn, the more you could connect to the inner and outer level of performing and feeling and connecting to God through any particular mitzvah. And part of that is because God put himself in the Torah. He put an ability to cleave to him, to a spiritual connectivity through Torah. And he gave us that desire to cleave to the Torah and through that to cleave to him, to connect to him. So that's the meaning of the Adabra Lokim is called God spoke all of this. That's all of this is going on Abraham, meaning it used to be that Abraham used to have to meditate, contemplate, connect, visualize, enter into the higher realms, 
come up with what the source of the way things need to be, and that was the source of the mitzvahs. And now God is saying, I I give you the mechanism to be able to do all that. It's 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 not that that what should happen is now you have the performance of the mitzvot without the kavanah. You have the performance and the kavanah embedded in the Torah. You have the mystical dimension embedded in the Torah. Or, and it's basically saying the same thing, God spoke all these things saying, The Torah, the point of the Torah is to cleave to God, just the way like Abraham cleaved, to say what, which is Anochi Hashem Elokecha, the idea of having this intense emuna, faith and closeness to God. Okay. Now, you have to realize many of the teachings about the, tz the tzaddikim, the power of the tzaddikim, basically have to do with s some already received traditions, both in the Talmud and in the, in the Zohar and Kabbalah, that uh, uh, God can decide one thing and, and, and the tzaddik has the ability to reverse that decision. Uh, you know, God is gozer, but tzaddik mvatal. God decrees and, and the tzaddik undoes the decree. Now, a lot of people say so. So there's two ways to, to, to look at this. One way is, wow, what a radical idea. But then the thing is, it's but the, that radical idea has been around for a couple thousand years. So why are we pinning it all to the 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 Nomali Melech and then his student the Sea of Lublin. Why don't we just say this is a long tradition in Judaism? Well, because imagine okay. using that and expecting people to like apply that to you. That's very different when it's a theoretical concept. But when you're saying I'm the tzaddik, even though we just got through saying that you can't say that you're the tzaddik, but yet somehow they taught that you can't say that you're a tzaddik, but they themselves were seen as tzaddikim. And when they taught about what the power of a tzaddik is, it was widely understood to be talking about themselves. So that was the radicalism of what the Noam Lemelech did. It wasn't the teaching. It was that he wasn't just teaching about something that Talmud is saying that nobody thinks means anything today. Like if I would teach you the Nomali Malaf and read you 10 teachings about the power of the tzaddik and how you need the tzaddik to wipe your soul clean, you wouldn't think that I'm talking about myself. I, I, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't even think that you would think that because to me, I'm almost critical of some of these teachings because... Uh, you know, a real tzaddik is few and far between the, the level of a tzaddik of what, what Noam al believed what tzaddik really was. So that being the case, fine. But if you if I said those things and I was talking about myself and I expected people to venerate me on that level, I could that would be the challenge. That's that's why people are are, I don't want to say disturbed, but yes, they are disturbed by the emphasis in the tzaddik. Now, let's, let's go further. Now, we mentioned the, the brother. Last time we met, we talked about Reb Zusha and and, and, and um, we talked about Reb Zusha last time, right? Yeah. So, Reb Zusha, on, men, on one of his many travels, went to some town 
And in the town, there was a young boy named Yaakov Yitzchak. And he positioned, he, 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 was, he, he was davening not far from this boy with great intensity as he would daven. And at some point, this boy was mesmerized by him. And at some point, Abzusha, he took off his, his talus and he gave a very intense look into this boy that, that pierced this boy's heart. And the boy had a overwhelming feeling and started crying. And he cried for, it felt like hours. He cried for a long, long time. And Reb Zusha said, I open your heart, but you have to go study with the Magad of Ms. Rich so he'll open up your mind. Anyway, that boy would turn into the seer of Leblin. He went to the Magad for a little while, and then he went to Mishmul um, Shvelk of Nicholsburg, another student and contemporary of the Magad, who was a great Talmudic scholar. And th this young man was so serious that Shmuel Shmelk of Nicholsburg sent him back to where he all started from to a position. He said, you opened up the tears of sadness for this young boy. Now it's time for you to open up joy for him. And then he went to not just Rebzusha, but also to Rebbe Melech of Lashansk and became the star student of Rebbe Melech. At some point, maybe even in Rebbe Melech's lifetime, towards the end, he opened up his own court. He is seen, even though Rebbe Melech Lushetsk is the founder of Hasidism in Poland, his student, the Seer of Lublin, is the popularizer, the one who, under his tutelage, a majority of religious Jews in Poland, which the religious Jews were the majority of Jews in Poland, became Hasidic in his lifetime. Within a short amount of time, under the auspices of the seer and his students, such as the Abder Rebbe, and, and much of all of the Hasidic streams, with some minor exceptions, come out of the students and students' students of the Seer of Lublin. Now, the Seer of Lublin, there's a lot of stories about the Seer of Lublin. One of them we, we shared was that he, Rebbe Lemel said, go to Rebbe Zusha for a lesson. And Rebbe Zusha was the one who taught him now, when you see somebody who's doing something wrong, don't tell them they're doing something wrong. Instead, shine a light into them, and then they'll find the elevation to, to do what's good. Okay. So the problem was right away, is you have Rebbe Melech and the seer, super popular, thousands of Hasidim are coming, and you know, I listened to Elie Wiesel, um, I don't know, 45 years ago, 50, 50 plus years ago, maybe 55 years ago. Yeah, 67. I don't know, that's 50, over 55 years ago. I think it was 67. Uh, a, a, a recording of a lecture he gave on the Kutzker Rebbe. Beautiful. Beautiful talk at the 92nd Street Y. Look it up later. Very poetic, very beautiful. So one of the points he makes, and I can't really make any of his points accurately because he's really all about not just factual information, but about prose, the poetry. It's so powerful, so, so intense. So listen to that on your own. But one of the points he does make is that the seer taught how easy it is to be a Jew. You don't have to worry if you don't know the whole Talmud. God doesn't care so much about that. 
And you have to have faith, but God loves loves you. You have to have camaraderie, but come join the Hasidim and, and you'll have it. And you have to have simply, you have to have joy. So the seer himself wasn't known to be a very joyous person, but when people would go to him, they would literally feel that their soul was like for the first time in their life, taken out of their body, cleaned, elevated, and put back in them. He would transform people like basically on the spot. He even talked about how he could, what he could do for other people, but couldn't do for himself. He could shine light into other people, but he himself remained dark. So what ends up happening is not only is it wildly popular, there's a sense that with the popularity is coming a watered down version where what was always considered paramount, which is Torah study, Talmud study, is not being adequately addressed. Now that's a simple version of things. If you want to a little more in depth, there's a fellow, Mickey Rosen, he was the founder of Yakar. He wrote a book of Rav Simcha Bunim Apshista. So basically, or, or, or was it on the Yid? Maybe, no, maybe it was on the Yid HaKadosh. Basically, three rabbis broke away. I say three. Hundreds of rabbis, maybe even thousands, broke away from the Seer Blueprint. But three of them created a chain. They were all alive at the same time, but they all served one after the other as Rebbe's of the breakaway from the seer. And those are the Yid HaKadosh, also almost the same identical name as the seer, Lin Yaakov Yitzchak. That's why you got to call them by their nicknames, the seer versus the Holy Jew. The Holy Jew, and then the second one was Simcha Bunim of Shizcha, who was also a pharmacist at one time and a businessman, and the Menachem Mendel of Katz. We're going to deal with the Menachem Mendel of Katz. He was the youngest of the three. They, they, their rebellion was a rebellion against the emphasis being on the tzaddik. And the emphasis being on, according to Mickey Rosen, on Kabbalah. And the new emphasis was on your own growth, and more on studying Talmud and refining yourself through studying Talmud with the Tosros, not just Kabbalah, not that not just the, not that the Hasidim of the Seer didn't study any Talmud, but it wasn't seen as serious enough. Out of those three, a renaissance of scholarship would happen within the Hasidic community. Their students and their the, 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 the second and third generation of their students would go on to be such great Talmudic and Hasidic luminaries, such as Chadush Arim, the Svas Emes, the founder of the Ger Hasidic dynasty and his grandson, who was the second uh, Rebbe of Ger, who are now considered to be the heirs of the Ger Hasidic movement, which is the first or second or third biggest Hasidic movement in the world. Also, the son-in-law and grandson of the Kutzka Rebbe, who we're talking about, were tremendous Talmudic scholars whose work are often studied in non-Hasidic yeshivas. The Avnei Nezer. Other, otherwise known as the Sachachavar Gain. Okay, the Avnei Nezer is, an, is, 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 a, is a name of one of his Talmudic works. And the Igle Tal, another one of his works. These are tremendous. Chedushi, the the Sfas Emes also wrote tremendous scholarship on halacha and Talmud. Besides for non-Talmudic teachings, Hasidic teachings. So again, their their rebellion produced offsprings. Torah giants and Hasidic communities that some of them flourish until today. What's interesting is if you look at the Kotzka Rebbe, the Kotzka Rebbe was the most rebellious of these rebels. And 
one of the things they were rebelling against was the Hasidic Rebbe's integral role as not just as what you were talking about, Alex, before, as the um, what, what's the name for a social worker in chief, but miracle worker in chief. As a miracle worker in chief does two things. They help a destitute farmer or peddler have hope that they'll be able to find money to pay the parts, the rent, and not be thrown into jail. And miracles would follow. Whether you believe the miracle actually happened or that the fate of the chassid turned into something that helped save the chassid's life, either way, it saved the chassid's life, right? So guess who didn't want to play that game? These three, especially the Kutzker, they weren't interested in giving blessings to help people have miracles in their lives. Their goal, especially the Kutzker, was to help people serve God. Now, if the rebellion in the beginning was a de-emphasis of the tzaddik and de-emphasis of, of just hoping that somehow your connection to the tzaddik would either miraculously give you what you needed, save you from what was wrong in the world, the rebellion of Kutz was much more than that. The rebellion of Kutz was no longer just against an ossification of Hasidism, but the very soul of Judaic practice, which relies heavily on repetition. Meaning, why are you Jewish? Because your father was Jewish, your mother was Jewish. Why do you put on film? Because I put it on yesterday. So the Kotzker did something very dangerous and he paid for it dearly. He challenged all that. He didn't say don't put on film. But here's the story of what it would be like to be initiated, the initiation rites into Kotsk. The young man would come into Kotsk. Often they would take all of his money away and share it. It was a kibbutz. It was a collective community. So, okay, he lost his money. They'd keep him up late with the farbrengen with a little bit of booze. So he'd sleep in the next morning. He'd come into the base medrash. And remember, this is, these are not Chabad Hasidim. So that's important to keep in, in the back of your mind. And he would see an old Jew with a bottle of whiskey. I got a nice prop here. <laughs> and the, he would ask the old Jew, where is everyone? He says, I, I guess they're sleeping. So the, he said, the, the, the new recruit would say, okay, so now I guess I have to daven. And the old chassid with the long beard would say, look, before you daven, why don't I pour you a big glass of whiskey? I'm sure your davening will be better. He'd, he'd pour him the, the big glass of whiskey Glug, 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 glug. The guy would drink the whiskey. Now, you have to understand, in Shulchan you can drink water before davening. That's just about it. Now, there's a question of coffee. Maybe you can have black coffee, but not with the milk, you know? It's very strict, the Shulchan about these things. I said, Chabad is not so careful anymore. Back then, even they were probably still careful. So the Hasidim would come in and say, what are you doing? You're drinking a glass of whiskey before the avenue? You'd say, yeah. They'd say, why? They'd say, this, this you know, Hasidic gentleman, this, this, this sage and scholar told me to. They said, let me ask you something. Who do you listen to, God or a beard? In other words, who is this guy? It's, they don't know. It's an unknown person, but he has a long white beard. So people think a long white beard has some authority. So you're listening to somebody because of his beard. You're not listening to the, the halacha. You're not listening to what God wants. You're, listen, you're conforming to what you think is the new environment. You're a conformist. You're not worshiping God. That was the essence of Kotsk, is that they hated people conforming to religion. 
to conform to religion was to undermine the experience of connecting to truly connecting to God. It's a radical idea, crazy. So crazy that the Hasidim hated him more than the Misnagdim hated him. Because it's undermining everything. We, we rely on, on, we rely on doing what we did. I don't wake up today and say, you know, I know I brushed my teeth yesterday, but maybe today I shouldn't. I know I dabbed yesterday, maybe today I shouldn't. Why should I dab? Tell me why I should dab. No, I just, I brush my teeth and I dab it. So to start kind of like undermining all that is a massive earthquake. Let's stop for a second and, and, and pray that they find some more survivors because so many people did not survive those terrible earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Let's think about them for a second, all the pain there. God should have compassion on them and they should be found quickly and, and uh, taken care of and have a complete healing for those who are still alive. So this is a big controversy. What the, what the, what the Kutzker unleashed was a very big controversy. I, 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 if somebody's coming, like this person who's so incomplete and confused and 90% and, and empty of where he needs to really be, then you, it's, you can't just connect to God. Obviously, the growth pattern is by em, em, not only learning, but emulating positive people, mentors and positive people who so that, are in a higher level than you are. That's why the Kutzker, the Kutzker was inviting disaster in a, in a sense, because we all rely on, on, on emulating it. What's the Shulchan Aruch? I mean, I'll, I'll take it a step back. I'll tell you one last story. Um, but that that's the, but I think the point is, yes, Alex, you're right. But I think that he had a point to make. So he, maybe he went a little far in making it, but we have to like re be reminded of that point. I'll make one more story to kind of show you uh, his point again, and, and, and understand that it's, it's a dangerous, it's, it's a razor's edge. I, I think Ali Wiesel would say that the, the goal was to be on top of the world for the Kutzker, to be on top of the world on a razor's edge. I don't know if that's just poetry that he made up, or he actually said something to that effect, the Kutzker Rebbe, I don't know. So here's another story with, with a grandson of Rebbe Akiva Eger. Rebbe Akiva Eger was, was the, the grand rabbi of his day. He was the Gadol, the undisputed great rabbi of his generation. He had a son and a grandson that were each a prince in their own right. And this young man was named Labela Eger. He was going to inherit his father's yeshiva. He was going to be a great rabbi in the Lithuanian style. And he was on the way to this, for sure. He had like a shoe in to become like a great, great, you know, big deal. It was already a big deal. But the Hasidim heard about him and they went to the town that he lived in and two Kotzker Hasidim showed up for, uh, the night of Yom Kippur. And after Kol Nidre, everyone left the show and there were only three Jews left in the synagogue, the two Hasidim and a label of Eger, the two Kotzker Hasidim. So again, I'm using the whiskey as a prop. I don't know, it's just like a prop that happens to be handy today. The two Hasidim took out the bottle of whiskey, they poured glug, 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 each other, and they said, isn't it great that our, all our sins are forgiven? Now remember, it's Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur just started an hour or two ago. It's still very much in the past. And if you have to eat or drink because you're you know, really old or sick, you know, that's one thing. These two chassidim were neither, and they were drinking, about to drink whiskey, and they're bara. And, and uh, at this point, they got the label of Eger's attention, who was busy praying and saying, tell him, but he said, he said, stop, metarnish, you know, don't, don't do it. You're not allowed to do it. So the chassidim said, there's up, who says that? So 
he said it's the Gemara says it, the Shachanat, the rabbis all say, you know, the, the, the Torah says it. And okay, fine. So the Torah says it. So they asked him again. So who who said that? Like who's the Torah to say that? They said, ah, that that this the Rabbinish Lamb is coming from God. And they said something like, you know who God is, you know God. But the way they said it, or like who is and who is God, the way they said it, he realized he never really thought about that. He had a relationship with Torah, he had a relationship with Allah, he was a Torah scholar. Again, you could say, what do you mean? It sounds so strange. He's the grandson of, <laughs> of Rabbi Kiva Eger. Did he not think about God? Well, of course he did think about God, but I guess he didn't think that he thought deeply enough about it. There was something bothering him about his relationship with God that he didn't feel he had a strong relationship with God outside of just Torah. So he said, I don't really know about God. And he started crying because he was a very sensitive person. And um, he said, can you teach me something about God? He said, we, we don't know either, but we know somebody who knows something. That's the Rebbe of Kutsk. Come to Kutsk and um, you'll learn something about God. So he went to Kutsk and his father went to get him. Shlomo Eger, who was a great scholar <laughs> in his own right, one of the great luminaries of the Lithuanian world. And he sees that, um, you know, we have a washing machine and a dryer to wash our clothes in, but you know what they would wash their clothes in? In, in the well or by the well, they pour the water on their clothes. Now, usually somebody in that level, they didn't need to clean their own clothes. They would have a, a helper clean their clothes. But we're, he was standing barefoot and he was washing his socks. Meaning he didn't he didn't have a clean pair. He had one pair of socks. I guess he ran there so quickly he didn't pack a proper wardrobe. So he's standing barefoot washing his socks. So his father said, "Look what they've done to you. They've taken a great man, and they've humiliated him. They've made him into like a nobody and a nothing. Like you're a nothing over here, like a schlepper, you know." So. The Labela Eger responded by saying, I might be missing a line or two, but he said something that if there's one thing I learned here, and this goes all the way back to where we started the share today with the Nomali Malaf, the first teaching I taught you from him, is that the more you know, actually, um, the second teaching I told you from him, the more you know, the less you think of yourself. Did you repeat that? The more you know, yeah, the less you think of yourself. Uh -huh. Meaning, the more, the closer you get to God, the less of the ego you you have about yourself. That's why he was, you know, it, meaning he was a humble, he had learned more about humility. And that was part of the reason why he was going. So this gets back to like a different time. So again, at the same time that there were certain things that Kusk was rebelling for sure against the seer and against his teacher, Abelimela, there were other strands that he was just really carrying right through like this one. That strand might have gotten lost in the power of the court of the Sea of Lublin. That's a powerful thing. We're going to continue. We're going to continue learning uh, on Shabbos about the 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 Kutskas, as Yard said, is coming out Monday. I don't know. I'm, I'm having a hard time to know this.